I found out that you need a sense of history um, in order to understand your place today in this world. And so I finally began to pay attention to where I had come from. And um, I think it's really important for me to share this part with you, for you to understand uh, the context of my family and where we had come from. On the left, you see my grandfather. And on the right, you see my grandfather and grandmother with their three sons. The oldest is my, my father, Kadao Kochi. They live on a tiny little island um, in the inland sea, right below the tip of Honshu. And um, he, didn't, he was a wealthy merchant, but he was adventurous probably and came to Hawaii as an immigrant. And so my dad was born in Punene, in Maui, the last sugar plantation. And um, I guess he found out that it wasn't so much fun um, working in the cane field, that he had a better life back in Japan where he was fairly well to do. So he took his uh, uh, family back to Japan where my father was raised in really nice style. As you can see, <laughs> he was um, kind of a oshari, uh, oshari kind of guy because his pictures show that. He's also very well rounded, so you see a picture of him diving off the tip of the boat. But he grew up uh, with very good education and um, became kind of, a, kind of a, a man of the world. And here he's saying goodbye to his classmates because um, now that he was finished with school, he had to figure out what he was gonna do with his life. He was very intellectual and uh, he wanted to get back to Hawaii. So he said goodbye friends. And he came to probably Wainai or Wahiawa, I think it's Wainai, as a Japanese school sensei. But at that young age, he could already tell that he was not going to be able to support a family as a Japanese school sensei. So he went right back to Japan and entered uh, the Buddhist um, ministry at, in Kyoto. You can see him here with his little humble broom. And he's told me several times the story about the broom, but I probably haven't remembered the reason for that broom. But Kojo Sensei is right here in the second row, so you can ask him what is the significance of the broom? Because you can see all of the um, recruits there that are going to be become ministers holding that broom. So it, it probably has some really important significance. Well, he went on, graduated with his class, and became ordained as a minister. Um, you notice he was completely bald because that was part of becoming a monk. But later on, I guess he kind of liked his looks better with some hair. So when he became a real minister, he uh, grew back his hair. On the other side of the family, Harumi, her maiden name was Kochi, Kochi um, had a very similar experience in that her family comes from Kaminoseki. It's a teeny little island right off the tip of the bottom of Japan. Japan. So if you look at Yanai, which is the last town in, in Honshu, and you take a boat and you go to the first island there, that's Kaminoseki. And that's where my mother um, grew up. She wasn't born there. She was actually born in Kaka'ako. Believe it or not, a new happening place. The reason why she was born in Kaka'ako is because her father on the left was a fisherman and he had the bright idea that he came to Hawaii and worked hard until he was 65. He could go back to America, uh, not to America Japan with his social security and they would be very well uh, funded with the social security. So um, he stayed in Hawaii. My mother, who was born there in the center picture, she, and, uh, at age 12, went with her mother back to Kaminoseki because as a fisherman's wife, she didn't have too much to do. Whereas back in Japan, they had a large, large rice farm where she could uh, be more useful. So 
Young Harumi at age 12 went back to Japan and entered the school at, in Kaminoseki. It's a girls' school. And you can see her there with her class. And um, she's, if you look, um, seated near the top, you can see Harumi there. She's got a very round face and re really stands out whenever you see her in a group picture. Here she was as a young Nisei because her parents were Issei. She was Nisei in the uh, second generation because she was born in Hawaii. So she was American. And her heart, though, was with her mother. And she grew up in Japan and uh, loved uh, being there. Um, and, and that's where she grew up until she graduated from high school. Well. Upon graduation, my father, who had just completed his uh, ministry, wanted to come back to Hawaii because he wanted to become a minister in Hawaii. But they wouldn't allow him to come as a single minister. He had to get a wife. Well, he was looking ahead. He was not going to get a wife from Japan. So what he did was he and a go-between um, checked out all the available women in Yamaguchi Ken because in those days you marry in your Kenjin If you're Yamaguchi Ken, you marry Yamaguchi Ken. If you're Hiroshima Ken, you marry Hiroshima Ken. And he found 40 available young ladies. <laughs> so he and the um, go between really diligently went and met each one. And toward the end, he came to the little island of Kaminoseki, which was so remote. And then uh, this story comes to me from my auntie. Well, he trudged up the path to my uh, grandmother's house. And there was this 19-year-old girl who had just taken a shower, or a tub bath, I should say, no shower. And she had long black hair. The window was open. She was sitting in front of one of those mirrors, a tall, beautiful, graceful mirrors. And she was combing her wet hair back. Well, he peeked in the window and saw this girl. <laughs> he approached them with his uh, go-between. She was not interested. She was 19 years old. She hasn't had any fun yet. So she turned him down. Well. He's kind of persistent. So he went halfway down that hill, and there was a little hotel there or an inn. And he stayed there for two weeks. And kept pestering her and pestering her. He and the Gobi Tony would not leave. And finally, with her mother and father, uh, not, not father, her mother's encouragement, go and marry him. He's a minister. You know, you're going to have a good life in Hawaii. Your father is a fisherman in Hawaii. He would love to have you close by. So she said, hmm, let me try it for a while. <laughs> this is her story. She said it over and over for her whole life. She said, yeah, I would try it for a while. Uh, a while. And if I don't like it, you know, I can always come back. So this young 19-year-old Harumi was groomed up to become a bride. and. They had a proper Yamaguchi Ken Japanese wedding. And it's a big deal, you know, the Japanese wedding. Um, you dress like that once in your life because you could be married once, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they tied the knot, and two of them came to Hawaii on the steamship, I suppose, because I don't think the airlines were really efficient at that time. And there's my father with his uh, younger brother, and there's my mother taking her first uh, trip as Mrs. Kochi. Not Kochi, but Mrs. Kochi. Well, the first place they... Oh, this is one thing I, I wanted to share. On the right is the little town of Kaminoseki, the front street. Because when I went there at age 20, my dad took me along as his fukudancho, which is assistant tour director. And so the assistant tour director, for the first time, 
met a whole family of people that made such a difference in my life because prior to that I just never felt connected to anybody and suddenly I had a grandmother who talked like my mother or my mother talked like her I had cousins I had a sense of belonging to a line of people that I had never had before. And so at age 20, I suddenly became more interested in my family and where I came from and all of that. When I went to get the Hongkahongaji uh, Living Treasures Award in 2006, uh, Bishop Yosimori came to me and told me, I want to share with you one thing. Do you know that your dad is the only Hongpahonganji minister who preached on every single island? He lived on most of the islands, but he also preached on every island. And he's the only minister in all of the ministers in Hawaii who did that. And so for the first time, this is just recently, I got a sense of my father's uh, journey as a minister. And um, I don't know where Kopaiko is, somewhere in the top side of uh, Hawaii Island. And so he started his family there. You can see my mother with her firstborn child, Claude. And here he is with his firstborn child. And um, he's getting to know the congregation. and. Um, trying to establish himself as a minister. Uh, on the left, you can see uh, him wearing his yukata. Most of the time, that's how he was dressed. He would wear this yukata with a belt, sash around his waist, to all the years that we were growing up. On the right, you see Poela Honganji. I have gone back to Maui many times, and I've driven around and around Haiku, Paia, uh, Makawao, looking for where was I born. I was born in Poela, but I could never find the church because it's no longer there. But I did find one picture there. Well, my dad and mom were very busy. It's a little <laughs> country church. What can you do? I mean, you know, you have a lot of people. So along came Stanley which is in the bottom picture. The top picture is Claude. Second picture is Stanley. And the little baby there, that's me. <laughs> Hard to be me. So anyway, the family started to grow. And um, my dad, after three years, like most of the ministers, had to move after three years. So the place, the place they went was the closest, which was the island of Lanai. And uh, you can see my mother, she's still quite young, but look at her family. <laughs> Just Claude, Stanley, myself, and then she had another one. His name was Norman Yochan. Well, it was, this is where the church was. It was right next to the school. Picture of the night, it's one mile square. In the upper left-hand side is the school, and the temple is right next to it. Over on the right-hand side is Koele, uh, which is now a big, beautiful resort. On the bottom left was an area I never went to, and on the bottom, uh, uh, on the bottom right, but on the bottom left was the place that eventually would, would become our home. But at that time, this was the Buddhist church, and uh, on the right, kitty corner to the church was the police station. And I mention this because the police station became very important in the story. The, when the war broke out, they found all the key people in the community. And because all the Japanese were at the Buddhist church, the Buddhist church was the center of their life. And at the center of their life was the sensei, which was Reverend Kochi and Nakamura Sensei, the handsome gentleman to his right. He was a Japanese school sensei. Together, they rallied all the community members. And uh, so every single Buddhist minister, I think, in Hawaii may have gone. I'm not really sure on this, but I heard at one time that um, they were all sent 
to relocation camp. Well, before the process from the time the war hit until he can relocate the Japanese is very long. And so the key people, my dad and uh, Nakamura Sensei, were sequestered here in this little two-room building right next to the police station. When Arnold Meister and I went back to Japan, not Japan, we went back to Lanai to visit in 2009, I took a picture of this jail, and I said, why is it still here? Mrs. Matsumoto, who was uh, taking us around, said, because they can't tear it down. It's a historic building. It shows the jail during the war. Well, my, there were two separate rooms with two separate doors, and my dad was in one, and Nakamura Sensei was in the right. And I peeked in from the side window where the toilet was. Well, that was the jail, and my dad and Nakamura says it spent some time in there, and I heard, but I don't know on this if, uh, if the details, they were sent to uh, Maui for part of um, their uh, being in jail. And the family was left there until they could decide what was going to happen to this family. Well, as, ha as with many of the Japanese families that were sent to relocation camp. We were all gathered up, um, gotten rid of a lot of things, and we all went on the steamship, which, by the way, is not the Lurley or any other <laughs> ship like that. It was a scary, scary ship. And this is my first recollection of being alive, and I was so frightened on the ship because wherever you look, you just see this black sea out there. And for years, until I was eight years old, I kept having this dream. I would get up in the middle of the night, and that's what I would be dreaming about, is this big round floating building with my dad behind the bars, and it would be floating around left and right. And that is um, what I recall of that steamship. On the right-hand side, is the table because you couldn't um, feed a lot of people if everybody was sitting down those who could stand would stand at this counter and eat my mom always had a baby one baby in her arm one baby wrapped around her thigh well i was the other one so in order to feed me she would put my food on the floor so this is part of a art piece i have in the back there uh, uh, spread out on the table, and the title of this piece is called Was I the Family Pet? <laughs> I remember from that two-year-old two age that whatever I saw, I remember because everything came to me as pictures, and if I think back and if I was paying attention, I would remember these things very clearly. Well, from the steamship, we all stopped in Fresno for a while. There was a boarding um, house there, and so the family stayed there until it was time, time to ship us out to where, wherever we were going to go for however long we were going to be there. And our first stop was Jerome. You can see my mother on the right with Jerome. But there was a problem with Jerome. For some reason, I don't know what the reason was, my dad couldn't be with the family. And so after this, we were moved uh, this was still Jerome, and it was very cold at that time, so this was our first taste of Arkansas winter. Um, you see me with my uh, little brother on the left, and um, Stanley and Claude, my two oldest brothers, freezing in the snow, and that's me with my little pink snowsuit. I was really happy to get the snowsuit, but not happy with the cold. Finally, the whole family was moved down to Rowa, Arkansas. And that, at that time, my family, uh, my father could be relocated with us. On the right side, you will see Nakamura Sensei in the center and his wife, who was my favorite lady. I used to call her Naka Sensei. And we were seated together. Now, on the left of Naka Sensei, this is uh, Mrs. Nakamura. You see a woman with a boy. That little boy for some reason really stick out, stuck out in my head and I remembered him because he had no fingers. His fingers were somehow cut off, but that's what I remembered about him. But I never saw him again because in, um, in the camp 
things happen. And what was happening at that time is new arrivals were coming fast and furious. They came on trains and they came in droves from all parts of America and Hawaii. You had to bring everything that wasn't taken away from you. Things like a picture of the emperor, uh, the Japanese flag, or literature that was Japan, from Japan were all burned or taken away. And so whatever you had left, you packed up and you came um, to the relocation camp. This is our fir first view of where we're going to stay. And um, that center wrote down, that was block 15. Block 15 was our block, and that was our new home. We didn't know how long it was going to be there, but as you can see from the pictures of all the snow on the barrack, it was a very hard reality at that time. Uh, all the blocks became new com communities, and we lived in Block 15. You pretty much don't go out of your block, because all that, that's your whole world. So all the barracks are lined up, and when you leave your block, it's another block. This was where we, uh, these were the uh, amenities, and they were communal because in, all the barracks were on all sides of the camp. And right in the middle, there was one large building, and that was the mess hall, the main place where we ate. And on the side of that was the bath facilities. They had these uh, kettles with fire uh, underneath that you could burn to make hot water. And so uh, in order to ha be, have any of hot water, all the people who had to pitch in and um, do free labor to chop wood. So the bottom right hand picture is the each community is chopping up their own wood in order to have hot water. And the family life in the camp was very simple. We never strayed very far from our barracks. My little brother, Yochang, he's the one on the left. He was my favorite companion. I never left his side. And that uh, was me on the right. And we, because we spent so much time in the barracks, my dad was beginning to become a photographer. So we were his subjects. So he has many pictures of um, us. Unfortunately, when he um, left Hanapimi Hongranji, he, he, he was going to throw out a huge box with pictures, and I grabbed it. But it was also um, a box that got lost in 1992, because when you have Hurricane Iniki, you're schlepping all your boxes around from place to place, and everything got wet and soaked and lost. And so a great part of history was lost, but whatever we had in the albums were what we were able to uh, keep. Sometimes he dressed us up, like there's Claude, my oldest brother on the left, and my second brother, Stanley, on the right, and there's me in the middle. Um, I remember that my brothers always had to have some kind of military gear. Uh, here they had this helmet that they wore all the time. Sometimes it was the pointed little hats that the soldiers wore uh, that are shaped like boys called uh, tents. Well, our family kept growing and there's my mother with child number, what is it, five? Yeah, that was my sister Elsie. And uh, I remember when that happened, it was very scary because I remember a pickup truck coming, driving in right up to our door, and I saw my dad putting a trench coat over my mother, and uh, this gentleman took my mother out the door. I cried the whole night. I had no idea where she was going. In the morning, my dad took me to the hospital, and we looked through the windows, and there was this beautiful baby, baby, and her name was Elsie Kazuko. Well, here we are living our life uh, with our favorite red wagon, and you can see how bleak it was. It, 
it had no trees there. I didn't know that there was such a thing as trees. And you know how much they say in education that you really need to expose your children from ages birth to five years old because those are the years where they're going to pick up the most information. Well, there wasn't much of anything to experience there because the life in the uh, camp was very simple and very bleak. But there also were many children <laughs> because what else do you do but make babies? So there were many, many babies. Um, I remember once they had a baby contest, and I have a picture also with all these mothers sitting in a row with newborn babies. Um, so there were a lot of children there. Uh, there's the picture on the right, my mother with the baby at the baby contest. And they would celebrate everything so that we wouldn't forget we were Japanese. And so the first time I saw this beautiful display of all these little Japanese dolls, and there's a whole arrangement for that. They dressed me in a, a kimono to stand in front of the Japanese dolls. But they also did things like graduations. So if you see uh, the top left-hand picture was some kind of graduation for the older people because they wanted to keep some sense of normalcy in um, the camp. Sometimes my mom would take us on an excursion, and this is part of the panel, uh, stitchery panel uh, in the back of the room. She would give us bottles and tell us, we're going to go catch fireflies. So we would walk along the grass. There was not much, just these round balls that rolled around. And then when the long train came, whizzing by, she would push our head to the ground so that we wouldn't be seen by the people on the train. It didn't matter where we were going. So um, I never knew where we were going until we would go behind some bushes. And I suspect that she might have been um, sneaking some food to my dad. This was at the time when he was still jailed. And she, I remember she, her talking that once in a while somebody would bring fish from the Mississippi River. And oh, if it's fish, my dad would be so happy. So she would cut and slice this muddy fish and try to give it to my dad for a, to make him happy. My dad, throughout the whole time that we were in the camp, looked very downtrodden, trodden, very beaten. I used to see my mom, he would not go to the mess hall to eat with us. He would sit on the side of his army bed, and my mom would bring the food home, set up a little table in front of him, and serve him the food that she brought back from the mess hall. And when I saw the movie Return to Manzanar, the man in that movie looked just like my dad, and he acted like my dad which was very sad for me because here's this man that was my father and he looked very beaten, but that was the image I had of him during the war. Because he was a proud young man, he was a proud young minister, his life was ahead of him, he wanted to do things, and here he was trapped in a place where nothing could be done. And so that was the image that I always had about him during the war. Years after the war, I would remember these pictures that were in my head. And so I decided one day, I'm going to sew these pictures. So I have a style of creating my art where I take a piece of cloth and I go to the sewing machine, which is threaded with black, black thread, and I sew like I'm drawing a, car, a contour drawing with pen, except I'm using black thread on a sewing machine and I move the fabric around and around like this. And the picture that you see on the left is of me um, having my Shirley Temple curls removed. I was born with really curly hair, which was problem problematic because as we were going from place to place to get to the camp, we would always have double bumps. And so the springs above the bottom bump would keep catching on to my hair curls. And so, and then the other thing is from the time we were on the steamship, I could never, I was always seasick, constantly. Whether we were in a car, the train, I always had to run to the bathroom. So here's this girl with her hair tangled in the 
um, sprains, trying to get to the bathroom, and my mother got pretty disgusted with that. So when we stopped in Fresno for the two weeks before we were shipped off to camp, my brother, uh, my father's brothers, who were debonair young Japanese, all came. There were four of them. They tied me to a chair. They all held me down, and my uncle took the scissors and cut my hair off. And I ended up with straight hair. I was so unhappy because I had two older brothers who teased me all the time and they would call me German helmet because of the shape of my hair. <laughs> and anything German in the war was not a good thing. So I was very unhappy with my German helmet hair. <laughs> so when we reached the camp, my mom found a hairdresser in one corner of the camp. So she took me to her, and this was my first and last experience with permanent. And the permanent in those days were pretty archaic. So she would curl my hair and strap me to some hot wires and she would turn the heat on and it would burn my hair and you couldn't move because you had to stay there until she decided my hair was curly enough. But when I came out of there, I thought I looked beautiful. So I kept doing this with my hand and my brothers would tease me because I was acting oshare. Oh, you saw oshare. I didn't know if I was happier with my German helmet hair or the Oshari. Both were teasing, but they, they love to tease me all the time. Well, because you have nothing to do, you have to figure out what you're going to do. My second brother was kind of a rascal and always thinking of what he could do. So one of the things that he and I did one day was we dug a large, large hole in the tomato garden. And then he put sticks across the hole and covered it with leaves. And then he put a lot of water in there so it was full of water. And then we looked for the first innocent victim to come by. And he would coax him to go over the branches and fall into the water. <laughs> but this was our way of you know, making um, life for ourselves. And there I am with my um, younger brother, Yochang, and my then best friend, who I've never seen again after the camp. Um, I'll go, I'm sorry, I forgot one. On the right hand side, on the right hand side is something that we did every Friday. All the kids in the camp would come and sit at the corner of the camp where the rubbish was dumped. And this man, a black man, on a wagon with a horse that had a hat would come by at a regular time every week. And all of us would be sitting on the stone wall, hoping that that week he would bring his son. And his son was the same color as him, very black. And we would stare at him and be so interested because we had never seen a black person before. Every once in a while, he would bring his daughter, who was always very pink, and she had so many little braids all over her hair, and each one was tied with a pink ribbon. And that was a special day. Uh, on the left, we have the bath routine. This was a time and motion study. My mom, with all her kids, would have to figure out, she would fill up two tubs. We would call it the sentoku tub because there are two portions to it. She'd fill it up with water that came from the uh, barrels that they had uh, fire underneath. Well, the first one was the bath water, so she would have to figure out who was going to be uh, bathed first. The youngest would be bathed first. And then I had to stand and carry one while she bathed the second one and then put them, uh, that child into the rinse water and wrap them with towel. It was very cold in the winter, freezing cold, and we had to stand there until the last child was washed and rinsed and we would bundle up and go home. On the right hand side, you see a picture of me at that age, four years old, very young, but a lady in the other corner of the camp needed to go somewhere. She had an infant child. My mom couldn't go. She had a lot of kids at home. 
So she, she took me down to the lady's house and said, you sit here and you watch the baby and you don't move because until this lady comes home. So the lady came home and she went to her closet and she pulled out a candy bar that was wrapped with paper. You know the kind that you see all over the store these days? I had never seen one like that before. It was a big candy with nice wrapping and she gave it to me and took me home. Well, that candy sat on our altar almost the whole week. So I sat there staring at the candy almost the whole week. Finally, my mom would take that out, open the wrapping, cut it into enough pieces so everybody had a piece of the candy, and that was my reward for being the babysitter. On the left-hand side, um, oh, when my sister was one year old, somebody roast, brought a roast chicken, like a whole roast chicken, which I'd never seen before, and that was our celebration for my sister's first birthday. Well, you know, chicken has only two legs, two wings, and I had two older brothers, so I never got a drumstick. On the right-hand side uh, was Christmas, so like everything else, we celebrated Christmas, uh, and they brought in a Santa Claus. Well, I was so scared. I looked at that man, I jumped on my father, and I cried and cried and cried. He had a toy for me, but I, I couldn't go and get the toy. So my hero little brother, Yo-Chang, he went and got the doll for me and brought it back to me and handed it to me. It was a doll that had two heads. At the top, it was a white head. And when you flip the skirt over and you look at the head on the other side, it had a black head. So it was a doll that it had a, whose skirt would flip up and down. So it was either a black doll or a white doll. I just treasured that doll because it came from my brother Yochan. Well, it was very cold that winter. And right after Christmas, my brother ended up in the hospital. But the hospital was very short-staffed in those days. My mother would go, but they couldn't keep her there because we had children at home. So she would go and see him, and she said that over the years, she keeps repeating the same story, that every time she went, Yong Chang was lying in his own shishi, and he was wet and cold, but he didn't last long. He died with pneumonia in the hospital. And so we had a funeral, and I remember the funeral clearly because just before they put the coffin into the hearse, they opened it up, and my mom uh, took these pins off this little black hat that had a veil on it, and she put the pins inside the coffin. She looked at me, I had the little doll with the two heads. She snatched it out of my hand and put it inside the coffin, and I cried and cried because I didn't want to give that up, but she said, no, you have to give that up. And so my best friend was gone, and it was very, very sad for me. And the sad part is he died on January 10th, which was my mother's birthday. So it was a very sad time. We, I don't think this was the picture of my brother's funeral, but it, you know, there were other funerals, and so we were dressed up, my brothers in their suit, and I was carrying a beautiful doll whose eyes opened and shut because a GI came one day and brought me that doll. I don't know who he is, but that's the doll, the only doll I ever had, and it was beautiful, and I had it until I was 12 years old and the arms and legs fell off. But it came from that GI who visited us. Well, there were other people with other stories, and there were many, many women in there, and they were kept busy doing things that was helpful for the wartime effort. But where are the men? The men were not there. I remember seeing all these uh, very feminine, beautiful women, and um, my dad, this is one story that he never told me about, but it came down to me. Uh, later on. He used to go every so often to a place called Camp Shelby where soldiers were 
And he came back very disillusioned every time he went because he would see all the Christian soldiers be very, very spiritual and paying attention to their religion and praying and, you know, uh, embracing their religion. And he would look at all of the Japanese soldiers. They sat dejected, unhappy, very listless, and didn't want to pray. And so this really bothered him. So he came back to the camp and gathered up all these beautiful young women and told them, you go find the food wherever you can and prepare a dish that the soldiers would like. And make sure it's something like sushi, namasu, and all these Japanese home-cooked food because that is what the soldiers need now. And I remember seeing all these beautiful women with their little plates of food and they were being put on this thing that we call cow wagon because you put all the cows in there and it has walls on the side and all the giggling ladies with their beautiful little skirts all dressed up were uh, pushed up into the wagon and they drove off. I lost all those pictures, but there were many, many pictures showing all these GIs dancing with young girls. And I always wonder, why are they dancing? Well, that was the dance party where my dad got the young girls to prepare their Japanese food and go and dance with these soldiers before they were shipped out. Well, they were shipped out, but, and some came home, but we really never came home. And so, near the end of the war, they had a giant uh, ceremony for those who never came back. And I don't think I went to this event, I would probably have remembered it, but I have pictures of this. All the ministers gathered, all the soldiers who were, were gathered and honored. And most of all, they were there to honor those who served to protect the country that locked them up locked and locked up their families. So this is like a massive funeral of the people that we lost. Ramifications of war are never pleasant. My brother died in the camp hospital. My sister who was born was born with a congenital condition, which she lived with for all 33 years of her life. This is not something that surfaced. It came out when she was nine, year old, nine years old and coming back to school, she fell into the ditch. And she, the reason was that she had a blood clot on her neck. And so they shipped her to uh, Queen's Hospital where uh, they did an operation. When she was 27 years old, I mean, she, she was fine. She, she couldn't walk when she came back. Her legs were penciled in because she was in the hospital for almost a year. But she learned to walk again and grew up, went to school, and, you know, had a very uh, productive young life. And they got married, and at the age of 27, right after her son Scotty was born, she had another massive stroke. This time, the operation was in the back of her spine. And so she was operated on by Dr. Cherry for 11 hours. He was unable to remove all of the tumor, but he did the best he could. But in the process, he had to sever her spine. So for the next five years of her life, she lived in a wheelchair as a paraplegic. And finally, at the age of 33, when her son was five or 66 years old, she passed away from the same condition which had come back, which probably was caused by the trauma that my mom suffered when she was carrying the child in the camp. And these are things you don't see, they surface later, but these are some of the atrocities that come out as a result of the war. Um, after the ceremony, they gathered the people, um, the ministers spoke, they all had a chance to eat. Um, but it was a sad time and it was close to the end of the war. 
there's a fallout that is sometimes not all bad. My father had many um, young soldiers coming back, but among his uh, belongings, I found many, many pictures, and I never knew why he had all these pictures. But remember that dance party where the young ladies and the young men met each other, and it's wartime? Well, friendships were formed, and over the years, these were the pictures that came back to me. Now, who these people are, I don't know. But my guess is that they probably met at the dance party. <laughs> and so this particular couple, her name was Grace, beautiful woman. And she was family friends for all the years and wrote to my mother. And about six months before my mother passed away, I remember seeing a letter from Grace. They kept in touch because they were lifelong friends. And my parents had a lot to do with the union of these young men and women. The war ends, 1945. It's time to pick up your life again. So good goodbyes were said. But the sad part about it and the big question was where to now? Many lost their homes and livelihood. A lot of the people were from farms in America, in um, the West Coast and all over the country. They had beautiful farms which were sold for a dollar to the white farmers. And so when they went back, there was no farm anymore. And so uh, this was the plight of many. Well, where did we go? My dad wanted to return to Lanai City, Lanai. This is the little island that we lived on just when the war broke out. Lanai is an island with coil, uh, with uh, Norfolk pine and pineapple. That's all you see, and some ironwood. That and to me, the Norfolk pines were so beautiful because during the five five years of my life, I didn't know there was such a thing as trees, and so. <laughs> When I came back and I saw these tall stat statuettes, trees, I thought they were really nice. Well, the jail was still there uh, across the street from the old temple, but um, everywhere around the one mile square of town was pineapples. Pineapples everywhere. And where was our church? This is the church before the war. You can see that temple bell hanging there. It was next to the um, Lanai City School. But when we came back, it was no longer a Buddhist church because it had become a Christian church. They had to sell the church for a dollar to the Christians. When I went to visit in 2009, Mrs. Matsumoto took me there. And we went to the little house next door, which was the parsonage. And she took me to the back corner of the house and she pointed to the window. She said, this was your bedroom here. And I was your babysitter. So that was very interesting for me. Um, but, you know, we no longer had a, a church to come back to. So, uh, and it took a long time to establish. So where did we stay? We stayed at, with the Nambasan family. So on the left you see Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Namba and her whole family living there. And when I went back to see how big this house was that I thought was really big, I don't know where we all fit. But we lived there for months and months until they built a church in the, the first corner of Lanai City, Lanai. So as you enter Lanai City, Lanai, the first corner lot, my dad took three buildings, he made one the temple, and there was a second one that was the office, toilet, and furo, and in the back was the big portion, which was the parsonage, because his family kept growing and growing and growing. So here's a picture of the growing family. There's my mom, and uh, most of the time we were just casually dressed, as you can see me with my brothers. and. Um, we just um, lived a life, very simple life, as my dad um, worked to develop his ministry. 
um, at that time in Lanai, another baby was born. So you can see on my mother's lap, my brother Masami. Now they had never experienced the war because they were the Ratun crop that came in Lanai. My mother, if you look at her in all the pictures, she looks very well groomed. But most of the time, this is how you saw her. Because she always had a baby, she would take the baby and she this long, long cloth. And she would wrap it around and around and crisscross in the front and wrap it around in the back so that the baby on her back would not fall, fall down. And she always had another baby that was around her thigh. And on the left, you see my sister, Kazuko, and my brother that was born in Lanai, his name is Masami. Um, he has an English name, Alvin Masami Kochi. But we all call each other by our Japanese name. The only two that were called by their English name was Claude and Stanley, because at the end, uh, toward, when they started to go to school, the war was still on, and it wasn't too cool to be called Hironori and Tadanori when you went to English school. So their name was changed to Claude and Stanley. But the rest of us were all called by our Japanese name. And uh, there you see my second brother um, in one of his favorite uh, pastimes, which is to be on the back of a steed. <laughs> because my mom has babies all the time, Every summer, she would gather us up and send us to boarding school. And our boarding school was the Hiromoto Dairy on Maui. And this was the Hiromoto family with those beautiful sons and daughters who ran this whole dairy. We just loved it there. We just enjoyed this family and um, were sad to come back to school because it, we, we, we were spending some happy days there. We ate at the table, family style, and it was always fun. And our favorite moment in all the summers that we went to um, Maui, Tawela Maui, was when um, they brought the mule out. Well, each of us took turns to ride the mule. But when Stanley went on, the mule wouldn't budge. And the family thought it was a lot of fun to let him sit there for a couple of hours. <laughs> so we have a souvenir picture of Stanley sitting there looking very dejected, but we all stood around and just laughed. The picture on the right is really interesting because 56 years after this, I happened to have a job where I had to pose as the grandmother, and they brought a man in who was going to be my husband in the, po uh, in, the uh, shoot, uh, in the photo shoot. He had a beautiful daughter who was his real daughter, and they got the golf pro from Princeville. So we were all sitting on the beach at Haname and Posey, but when you're waiting for the photographer, you talk story. So his daughter said, oh, we should just send this out as a Christmas picture and say, Merry Christmas from the Hiromotos. And I went, Hiromoto? And I looked at the man, my husband, and he was the, our babysitter from the Hiromoto Dairy. He was the older brother. And I looked at him, and he looked at me, and suddenly it clicked. We, he, we used to be at their boarding house at Tawila Dairy, and never realized that it was the same person. But this was a funny thing that happened. Well, in the night, my dad was um, trying to build his congregation. So, one of the things he did, and that was throughout our whole life, is every Friday night, whoever came, wanted to come, came. And our house was like a party house because members of the congregation would come. Some would come every Friday night, and some would come intermittently. But we ate together, and we just had a great time. And um, spent, um, this was what we did on, on Fridays. Then on Sundays, everybody came to church, and here's a special picture, because you can see the little house in the front covered with flowers, and that was a hanamatsuri uh, little altar. And I loved doing hanamatsuri because he would allow me to push all the akulikuli flowers into that and decorate that whole thing, and I thought it was such a special thing to do. He built the con 
congregation with children and one of the things we did most of the time is Sunday afternoon everybody would go down to Manele Beach and we would picnic and so this was part of the way he built the congregation and they would also come to church and um, when I went back in 2009 I took a picture of the <laughs> temple because an older gentleman came and told me do you remember that Ofuzudan? and I said Yes, I used to uh, dust it, and I, I made the Hanamatsuri little temple. And he said, but you remember what your dad did with it? And I said, no. And he said, when the war broke out, your dad had the foresight to know that they were going to burn everything that was Buddhist. So he had the members dismantle the whole thing because it comes apart. and. Uh, put it all together and hid it. And I said, he hid that? Where did he hide it? He said, in the cemetery. And I was speaking recently to Kepa Mali on Nanai, who was doing um, his oral histories, and he said, the, the Japanese love to do these shibais, so they had these sets that were used for all of the shibai, and there were painted sets that had Japanese uh, images on them. And they didn't want to lose that because it was a very important part of the Japanese culture. So what they did was they took all of those flats and they hid it under the houses in the night. So after the war, they were able to pull that out along with the Obutsuda, which is really beautiful because it doesn't have the shiny bright gold of the altars that you see now. It has a very rich patina and it's very beautiful. The other things that he did was to make sure that we always had Hanamatsuri programs so people would understand what was part of the culture. And the other thing is he brought back the Obon season because every summer in the Buddhist churches have this Obon celebration where the people that passed away would come back and uh, dance with us. And because we lost so many people, the Obon was very important. So on the left, you see the young men building the Yagura, which was a center um, built structure where the uh, bon dance is. And on the right-hand side, you can see the um, after-construction party where everybody would gather and socialize. When I went back in 2009, I, saw the, I took these pictures. And it's not the same Yagura, but they were still doing that. And the congregation was much smaller. So they would bring in people from Maui who would come over on the ferry with their mangoes and all their other omiyake. And they would uh, dance and it was, uh, they would bring their band. And so Arnold and I had the chance to enjoy this. And there is Mrs. Matsumoto who was our uh, tour guide for the time that we were there. Well, three years was coming to an end. He had built up the church, he had built up the congregation. Uh, there was a nice church with a temple and a parsonage and the office in between. They, there were a lot of things that were the same. There was Tamashiro Market still there. The boy at Tamashiro Market was sitting next to me in kindergarten, in third grade. And I remember that store because at the end of the day, if you had five cents in your pocket, you could stop at Tamashiro Market and buy a long john. And that was our favorite thing to do. And so this market is still there, surprisingly. And the Naihonganji is still there, even if they have to ship in their membership from Maui. Uh, this, we left Lanai in April 9, 1949, and we moved to Waimea, because Waimea was ravaged with uh, floods. The river was rising all the time whenever there were big rains. There was uh, Reverend Mrs. Owe there, and she was a single woman because her husband, the minister, had died, and she was trying to keep the Waimea church going, but it was very hard. So she was sent to Lanai Honganji, where everything was nice, there was a long, con big congregation, and we moved to Waimea, where there was an old-style temple there. And uh, although my last brother, Shoji, in, on the bicycle, was born in the night, it was December 28th, and we were trying to get to Waimea, so we were packing. He had no time to be taking pictures, 
So there's very, very few pictures of Shoji as a baby. But then when we came back to Lanai, he was got his cameras out, so he has a lot of pictures there. And there we are in the parsonage in Waimea, and the whole structure is changed now. They rebuilt the temple, they rebuilt the parsonage, and um, we, he did the same thing in Waimea that he did in Lanai. He started a Japanese school. It was a big, beautiful yard, so all the children in the, van, uh, in the valley came there. We played football, and whatever it was the seasonal thing that we were to do, it was just packed with kids. He had Japanese school going full-time, and uh, he was rebuilding his congregation there. Uh, when we came to the house, I remember the watermark on the building was about chest high because of, uh, the river had flooded the house. Well, that was cleaned up. We had two more floods after that where the same thing happened and we had to roll around the yard and the boat. But then they fixed the river and so we stopped doing that because everybody in Waimea Valley had to live up at the community hall where the Red Cross brought food for us and so on. But three years went by. It was a wonderful place to grow up because we could be in the river all summer long and swim we could go catch frogs, pick mango, eat mango. Um, every day, the first day of summer, all the boys in the valley would come and line up. My brother was the first. My mother would take out her shears. She would shave everybody bolo head. And so all the boys in the valley were running around bolo head, which was the style during the summer until school started. One day, she said, you do. So she cut my hair and I cried for a week. But this was the style she gave me. I lost my braids, but this is the style I had. And it was okay after a while. After one week of crying. So anyway, that was life in Waimea. But three years were coming up. So what happened? We had to move again. So we, in Ele Ele, there was an old temple at the top of the hill where Dairy Queen came. And it's now called Brines or something else. But there was this beautiful little temple where Reverend Yoshiko Shimabukuro was the minister. But she was a single minister and she was um, partially handicapped. So it was very hard for her to run this. So what happened is my dad came in and he built this beautiful temple along the side of the road. It was a wonderful place because it had this giant yard. Of course, Claude had to mow the entire yard, yeah. and he had to rake the, all the grass into the middle of the yard, and it was a huge pile of grass, so all the kids would dive in and play. And we all took turns. We all had jobs. Claude had to take care of the yard. I had to make sure the ovetsudam was clean all the time and mop the floor. I'm not sure what Stanley did, but he was around. And my sister was a fragile child. She was kind of camp pampered, but she too had her responsibilities. They also built the Japanese school to the left that was blown away by Iniki. But while it was there, my dad, Shimomokuro Sensei, and my mother had three, each had two or three classes of Japanese school that were filled and everybody was learning Japanese. My classmate told me at that time, I'm not going to Japanese school because my parents told me Japanese is going to become a forgotten language because all these Issei people are going to die off and pretty soon there won't be anybody speaking Japanese anymore. So my parents told me, I don't have to go to Japanese school. And I was very puzzled about that. But as it turned out, Japanese became a very, very important language. And those who had learned it were one step ahead because the, the relationship between America and Japan had a, was different, but there was still a relationship where Japanese became a very, very important language. As I said, we all had our tasks, so we had the security guard there, Masami and Shoji, <laughs> with their two guns on their hips. They made sure that uh, everything was kept safe around the church. Claude did his yard, Stanley did his thing, I did my thing, and um, so life went on, and my dad did the same thing in Hanapepe that he did in Manai and in Waimea, is to build the congregation, 
and to build a church and uh, make sure that people learn Japanese. There were uh, conventions there. There was go, uh, go tournament that lasted for a whole week. There was judo tournament. There was all kinds of things. And Hanukkah was really the happening place. There were kids, teenagers, young children, all congregating at the church. So it was a very, very busy, happy time. Um, of course, at that time, oh, and here was uh, the big celebration. When they built this church, they had something called a Chigo celebration. So in the left picture, you see the old Japanese temple on the left, up in LA. Starting there, that whole line of people, all dressed up with this special costume, came down the hill, went through old Hanapepe town, cut across by the fire station, and ended up at the church. And so everybody congregated there. It was huge. It was maybe over 2,000 people there. And they ended up with something very said I never forgot. All these men got up on the roof of the Japanese school, and they were going to throw out mochi. And every mochi had money inside. So as they threw the money off the roof, there the throngs of people underneath were scrambling around like when you Santa throws candy or Easter egg or whatever. And so it was something that I quite re I remember very much. Well, about this time, it was time for my dad to retire. And he had built a house in Hanama'uro. And uh, he um, was really having a hard time running the church at that time because my mother was in Honolulu taking care of my sister. She had to be hospitalized and lived in an iron lump for over a year. And so she, she kept saying, I will not lose another child to the hospital because I lost your child and I'm going to be here. I'm going to take care of my daughter, Kazuko, until she gets well. She eventually learned to walk and um, she was in a, a wheelchair, but she could feed herself and so on. And one of the things that she did was to go down to Manoa School and she would tutor children. She had about five or six children. But it was very hard for her because she was in a wheelchair and she had to be carried down the steps every time she went. And she would bug her principal until finally he built the ramp. The other thing that she did was there was a young politician who always wore a vest and a little braid in the back. He used to go and make the rounds and stop by and visit her. She and my mother were always there. Well, she would talk his ear up about, off about how hard it was to be handicapped and in a wheelchair. Well, he eventually ended up in Congress, and he was very, very uh, outspoken about the needs of people that were handicapped. And so out of that came the ADA rules. So now, um, you can see that a lot of uh, ADA people um, or handicapped people have um, an easier time to do what they have to do because they're stuck in a wheelchair. And uh, one of the things that I found is that through my art, I felt more, more and more the calling to. Uh, remember those who came before us. And so one of the things I did when my mom died at the age of 80, 83, I did a piece for University of Hawaii Art Gallery. It was a piece called Chui. And Chui is about the 49 days after a person dies that the soul begins to have to leave the body and go off to Nirvana. And so I created 49 of these little figures, and I have five in the back of the room, and they were all on a stand with all of my mother's superstitious words on that long pan. The three panels were covered with words that my mom would say, and they were all done with the stitchery uh, style of art, and they were hanging there. But if you look at the fi little figures and you turn them around, you can see that every figure has their legs uh, folded in. Uh, with their toes together. And when I used to go to Omaidi with my dad to people's homes, he would make me sit in the back, very back of the room. 
So I would look at everybody in front of me, and they were all sitting with their legs crossed. I don't know what happened to those people with bad knees. I could never do that. But all those people were sitting there, and they had their legs crossed, and I would be viewing them from the back. So when I made these pieces, you would see my little signature there of the toes uh, meeting in the back. Um, about this time, I think a lot of the legislation had passed where each person who was in the camp was going to be given $20,000. My dad had already passed away. My sister had passed away. So the $20,000 $20, did not go to them. But everybody else who was alive was given the $20,000 check. I got my check, and I looked at that check, and I thought, you know, something good has to come out of this because it's been a lot of bad in the war. And so I really thought about that long and hard. And then I asked my brother Masami if he could help me build my studio. So down in Yumalo, where I live now, I created something called the Art Pod. And so here's a little slideshow of what happened there. And an empty, marshy piece of land. I started to build a wall, put a floor, I had, I had enough money to buy the materials, and my brother sent his foreman to supervise the work. I had volunteers that came and worked on this. We put up the first wall, and then we finally got to the roof. And the day that we did, the days that we did the roof, a lot of our volunteers showed up. So there were um, sometimes quite a lot of people up there. And I remember one day, my brother Shoji came by with his friend. His name was Don Cataluno. They were standing there watching us. And the Mr. Cataluno asked me, who's there on the road helping you? I said, well, let me see. There's our foreman. He's, um, his name is Kawi, and he's uh, Portuguese Hawaiian. And then there's Mohammed over there. He's from Iran. And there's Pepe over there, he's from Ecuador. There's John Piero there, he's from Italy and Ethiopia. And Arnold was there that day. I said, Arnold is the German. And then my son Seiji, he's Japanese. And I was introducing everybody up on the roof. And he made a comment that I never forgot. He said, Wow, you got the whole United Nations up there on the roof. <laughs> So yes, we did finish the roof, and that today is called the Art Pod. And um, in order to remember this, I did a glass painting which is in the back of the room. I took all these separate images that I had of the wall going up, the backhoes, the ladders, the dog, the roll barrel, and I created this piece that to remember the building of the structure. And today, out of this art pod um, comes a lot of good. Out of this comes the airport displays that you see changing all the time. Out of this comes the Van Gogh program, which ministers to a lot of, I'm not ministers here, which educates a lot of children in art. And uh, we have the Kauai Press Studio, where a lot of uh, artists gather and work on uh, art very happily. And so out of the $20,000, which covered part of the building of the art pod, came a structure that is alive and living to me. Of course, my brother Shoji stops by all the time, and he said, what? You get disease or what? Always building, always building. <laughs> but uh, it seems to be a pattern, but it's all for the good, and it started with the twenty thousand dollars and I said it can't be all bad some good has to come out of the bad and that was my solution to this I thank my kids who were sadly neglected pretty much of their life there's Jody she's here there's Jerry who couldn't be here and Seiji 
Um, and they're my kids. They're the silver lining in my life. Although I must say, like my daughter just told me before this, you know, you're always working, working, working. Yep, we never saw you. But they turned out okay, so that's good. And um, here's the rest of my family, Claude on the left, who was told that he should not go to college because he was not college material, so better go to some technical school. So he went to aeronautical school, became an aeronautical mechanic, then an engineer, then worked for Edison Electric, uh, as an electrical engineer until finally he devised his own system which is to uh, balance electronic, electronically uh, correct the imbalance in large buildings. So he was in Hawaii all the time going from uh, one sugar mill to another sugar mill because every time one thing went a little off the whole building would shake and so he figured out a way to correct the imbalance. And so that's his business with his son. Um, but he, he also has passions, and one of his passions is to build uh, taiko drums and upright basses, and his son builds ukulele, and he loves Hawaiian music, so he's a huge supporter of the Hawaiian music program at Whittier. My second brother, um, He's happily retired now. I think he goes fishing. I never see him. But throughout his life, he worked for the steel company, and his job was very heavy duty. He put in the foundation for buildings such as the Maunalani Koele, and the Lanai Manele, and the Lanai, uh, the big long bridge that goes from the airport to Hanabaulu, chiefest Kamakahele school and all of this, but this was all work-related, and his passion is to go fishing, hunting. And now he, all he wants to do is be retired, and so he's the smart one in the family. <laughs> and then there's Masami, the really handsome guy there, and Shoji, I had to search through 35,000 images. I could not find a picture, because he's very camera shy, I found that. I finally found it this morning. and. Uh, they, uh, Masami is a contractor, and Shoji was here at KCC as a welding instructor. But these are my two younger brothers who didn't experience the war, but they experienced living in a family. And although my father never told us, you need to spend your time doing charitable things, my mom kept telling me, don't do charitable things. Pay attention to your kids. But today, these two brothers are staunch supporters. I think right now my brother is um, Sami spearheading the renovation of the Japanese school um, hall in Hanapepe that we spent a lot of wonderful uh, years um, enjoying. And Shoji's very, very active with the churches. And one thing I want to say about my brother Shoji is because he's the one with the heart who really cares. After Iniki, I saw him driving around with his friend Albert. His truck was piled high with plywood. He kept going from house to house, looking for old couples who couldn't do anything, and pound, pounding these plywoods up on their walls that were broken. And I answered, hey, can you come and help me with my wall? He said, you're not old. <laughs> <laughs> but that is so typical of him. <laughs> and that's the, why, uh, the reason why I think my parents stopped after him, because he didn't really the check. <laughs> my sister is not pictured here, but you heard her story. And she was a champion in spite of all her handicaps. And um, although the war was hard, my dad was sad. Um, he set the example for us that we need to build, and he was a master at it. And so this is my story of my family and how we survived the three years in the relocation camp. Thank you very much.